This audio is intended to orient you to Wilbur's work. Ken Wilbur started building the integral theory model, the four-quadrant model, the Aqual model that goes by different names, I don't know, some 30 years ago or more. It's important to understand that he's not just making stuff up, that more than anything, he's a synthesizer, that he reads really widely, and he is attempting to build this overarching worldview or conceptual model. We're not going to get into any of his own writing this week because he writes books, and I haven't really found any short readings, 15, 20 pages, by him. So what I've done is included three readings by other people writing about the integral model. I urge you to read them in the order in which they're listed in the resources for this week. Try to approach the model as a possibly useful tool for you to use in locating some of the different ideas and your own thoughts that we're going to encounter in the next nine weeks and that you've encountered in your own lives so far and will encounter. That's how I use it, and I've found it very helpful. I spend a good deal of my time when I'm reading Wilbur arguing against him and being deeply dissatisfied with what and how he's saying it. But nevertheless, I've found the study of his approach very fruitful over the years. One of the things that's quite astonishing to me is how little attention, both in science, often the social sciences, even the humanities at times, and in particular, all aspects of formal education, how little time and effort and attention is devoted to looking directly at consciousness. We spend almost all our time looking at either the physical world out there, or should say our experience of the physical world out there, or our experience of the conceptual world, the world of literature, the world of ideas. But it's rare that in the academic setting, we pause to hold the mirror up to this faculty we have of being aware. It's quite astonishing that not only is there a world, but an aspect of that world is the capacity for awareness, that the world is aware of itself through us, at least, and possibly the world is inherently aware of itself. And that is getting us back to Christian de Quincey's terms, the isms of last week. That would be the panpsychism view, is that some kind of sentience is built in to matter. But whether it makes more sense to use that approach or that somehow awareness, consciousness is an epiphenomenon that appeared once the neural system got complex enough, it now exists. Consciousness, awareness, and in our case, at least, and maybe other organisms, self-awareness is part of the universe that needs to be accounted for. One of the things I think that's really valuable about Wilbur's approach is his explicit consideration and inclusion of consciousness in his model. And not only consciousness, but also the evolution of consciousness, which I think is really vital in terms of environmental education and communication. So when we're communicating with other people, it's vital that we consider where they're coming from, not just their overt worldview, whether they're a Christian or a materialist or a Buddhist or a Muslim or a mix of all these things, but at what level they're manifesting that. Are they manifesting it in a very concrete, literalist way that they're really sure that their view is the right one and that it's a fundamental sort of approach to perceiving the world? Or is there more of a nuanced view that they're accepting their own worldview in metaphorical terms and they're willing to question the existence of their own worldview and the source of it and how it plays out and how coming from this worldview locates them in the rest of the world? So I think all of those questions are really interesting and important to consider. And in the Adaptation to Climate Change paper, they get into that in a pragmatic way. So just kind of keep your eyes open for that as we go along. 
So I'd like to get right into the Wilbur material now. Note that when you read the essay I wrote on Wilbur, there are footnotes in it, and those footnotes are listed at the back of the essay. So I encourage you, when you come to footnotes in the body of the essay, that you take the time to go and actually read the footnotes, because they'll clarify and deepen a lot of the ideas that I cover in the body of that essay. In the overview that I present of him, there are three different parts. There's his evolutionary developmental perspective, his hierarchy and holarchy theory, and his multifaceted ontology and pluralistic epistemology. When you read my essay, it's pretty clearly written, I think. It's fairly simple to follow along. The one thing I don't touch on particularly is this pluralistic epistemology. But I do go into that in one or more of the footnotes. One of the really important aspects of Wilbur's work is the tying together of the quantitative and qualitative world, the world of physical entities of material and the world of our inner experience. I think he's really important in making very explicit the importance of consciousness in our work. One of the really important aspects in Wilbur's work in terms of this uh, multiple methodologies is that depending on which aspect of the cosmos with a K that we're exploring, note that cosmos with a K includes cosmos with a C. Cosmos with a C in Wilbur's language means the physical world, and that's a vital part of cosmos with a K. But cosmos with a K is everything, so it includes the non-material aspect, the non-quantitative, those aspects of the world, the experiential aspects, that we can't measure, we can't experience with our senses, but nonetheless are vital. Strictly speaking, everything we experience is internal to us. All experience begins as personal experience that we can then discuss and turn objective within parentheses within a particular context. But here, Wilbur is differentiating between what we actually experience as internal to ourselves and what we experience as part of the external physical world. Wilbur talks about the three eyes the three different kinds of methodology we can use to explore different aspects of the world. From this perspective, there is nothing that's not accessible to scientific exploration. It's just that we need to expand what we normally consider as scientific methodologies. What we're looking at, then, is not simply quantitative methodologies or even rational methodologies, but any way that we can actually directly perceive the world. For Wilbur, the core element is that we don't take anything on faith, but that science has to be based in empiricism. And empiricism isn't only quantitative empiricism of what we can measure in the world, but anything we can directly experience. So we don't take anything on faith or because somebody told us or because we read it in a book, but we directly experience it for ourselves. And so science needs to propose a methodology and then we experience something directly, and then we discuss what we experience with peers to see whether what we've experienced personally resonates with those around us. If we're exploring the physical world, we do that through the methodology of our senses. If we're exploring the intellectual world, we do that through reason. And if we're experiencing and exploring the non-reason, the transpersonal world, what's beyond the capacity of the rational mind to apprehend, we do that through the methodology of meditation and contemplation. So if we're going into the transpersonal explorations, we do that beyond the thinking mind. That's kind of what I wanted to say about Wilbur. In terms of critiques, if you start resisting and feeling angry with the jargon, try to just set that aside and don't waste any time on that and just really engage with the world he's presenting. For me, his view of things expands my internal space of experience. Wilbur has this incredibly broad and deep map of the world, and I try to approach it rather than treat it too literally and reject and go through this whole thing, do I have to agree with this or does that make sense? I try to treat it as a metaphor 
that can expand my internal space of experience. And I also try to treat it as kind of a scaffolding on which I can begin to hang some of my own experiences because the way I experience the world is pretty fluid and I get lost. And I can also tend to, if I'm not careful, become reductionist in my view of the world. And so Wilbur presents this really depth view of things, of not reducing the world to anything 